I want to run a hex crawl. Great. Go to your office supply store, pick up a one inch three ring binder. One inch to start off is fine. Pick up some clear plastic sheets with the three rings. You can slide some pages in here. Get yourself some graph paper. Four squares per inch is usually standard. Can print yourself off for free online some hex paper. This does have a hex grid on it. It's very hard to see, so I went back over it with a pen. And get yourself some uh, colored pencils and some wet erase markers. Then you'll have all your supplies that you need when you got your dice. To set up your hex map, uh, besides the hex paper, I would also recommend setting up a calendar. So my calendar section's back here in my three ring binder. See my splash page is my year, and I've got it broken down into months. When an event occurs, months off, I've got it, I can note it down. So April 15th, there's a crusade. All right, now I don't need to keep that in my head. I don't need to remember that. It's just on this page. And then when we turn it, we get to the specific months. We're in the month of March. I check off the days. I've got 31 days in March. Here's a weather column, okay? Snow, rain. It's going to rain for a few days. There's a thunderstorm. I got the days of the week in case that's ever relevant. And then I just note down the events, okay? We got a peasant revolt that gets crushed a few days later. There's a green dragon sighting near the town. St. Diane's Feast is at the end of the month. This is really necessary, okay? Time tracking is essential, especially in a hex crawl campaign, all right? Gygax knew what he was talking about. He wasn't just memeing when he was talking about strict time records. This is the easiest way to keep everything together. You don't need to keep it all in your head. This, this style of calendar keeping, it's quick, it's easy. Generating weather ahead of time, that's one less thing I have to roll every day. I love doing it like this. You roll it ahead of time, you use your, your hex flowers or whatever you want to generate your weather. But I'm going to keep this aside because I want to track off days on it. Turns take days in hex crawls, so it's very useful to have just off to the side checking off days. I'll bring this back in a second. Here's my hex crawl section. I've got some stuff from Wilderlands of High Fantasy as far as generating uh, hex features. Really detailed, really wonderful stuff in Wilderlands of High Fantasy. If you can get your hands on a copy, you absolutely should. Print and play is fine. Um, whatever sort of tables you want to use to generate hex features on the fly. There's tons of good resources out there, blogs and whatnot. Um, generating caves on the fly. Here are the Wilderness Encounters from Moldvay Expert. X57 and X58 are the pages. I have them in this two-page spread because I've got my hex map right here. So when I roll an encounter, all I have to do is flip the page and I can see what monsters are generated. Very simple. Um, for my main page that I'm going to be keeping on while I'm running this hex crawl, I've got my hex map here and I've got my key here. So on this side of the page, on this this left side of, of, of this page, uh, I have what the numbers correspond to. So number one right here is our starting town. I know it's a little hard to read. Number two is a wizard's tower. And then as I generate hex features, I just I, I take this out of the plastic and I, I write down my number in a little circle and I put it here. Easy. This is just some notes to remind me uh, the chance for getting lost. Uh, a, a really quick and dirty way to generate some features on the fly and then encounter time and I'll go over all of that in a bit I'm sorry this is a lot of information I know but here's the real brilliance of keying your hex maps like this um, we have them in numbers and this is a three ring binder so I can take in pages and put out pages so some things aren't going to need a lot of information attached to them for example we've got uh, a hollow tree here that's just in, in this hex uh, number three there's a hollow tree. It's going to help them get their bearings. It's a feature, you know, if they if they think they're going north, but they've gone in circles and they wind back up at the hollow tree, they know they've gone around a circle. Hex features help keep your players oriented. Not all of them need to be keyed. But for something like a fortress, for example, number seven, all right, I've got my little map here. I've got my, my key. I can write down wandering monsters. I can take notes, whatever I want. And then if I ever generate something uh, uh, or, or let's say my players uh, check out these ruins and I need to key the ruins. Well, I just take a, a blank piece of graph paper, insert it in here, number four, ruins, and then I can note that down as well. Some of them need keys, some of them don't need keys. Very simple stuff. So the actual running of the hex crawl. Um, via expert, 
you're going to track distance with miles, um, but I've seen very compelling arguments for using a sort of uh, a point-based move system where you get so many hexes per day, let's say three hexes for simplicity's sake, and entering a hex costs a point. Um, so to enter a, a clear terrain, it only costs one point. Entering rough terrain, it costs two, and entering very rough terrain costs three. Um, I like doing that a lot better. It's a lot easier to keep track of rather than miles. And this brings me to the hex map and the terrain on the hex map, which I'm sure you'll see I've used colored pencils instead of using um, like little symbols. I think that this is the superior way of doing it, and I think the only reason they didn't do it back in the day is because color printers didn't exist. So if you were making products, or I, I don't know, maybe they just weren't as common, but if you were making products and selling them, it was harder to. Obviously, color printers existed, but you know what I mean. Um, so instead of drawing little uh, uh, little swamp features or something, pink is swamp, green is dense forest, purple is mountains, and then, of course, we've got the water and the coastline. Clearly, you can make this whatever makes sense to you. You can have your key or whatever. Uh, but one thing I like about doing this is you'll notice that some of the hexes are kind of one thing and kind of the other. Uh, we've got the swamp fading into this uh, uh, dense forest here. I like that. And, and this in and of itself is a pretty unique hex that players are going to remember. Um, so anyhow, how to <clears throat> start off running a hex crawl. And I would recommend before running a hex crawl for players or anything like that, I would absolutely recommend doing uh, some solo play, running a, a solo hex crawl just to get comfortable with it, to get the procedures down. And it's a lot of fun, too. I mean, why not? Uh, just for uh, your information, we've got a 15 by 18 hex map. I think that's definitely plenty for your first hex crawl. Six mile hexes, pretty standard. Um, and that's, I guess we're ready to start talking about it. Okay, so to start off, I'd tell players sort of like those old text-based adventures, what they see around them in, in the directions that they can go, and then they'll tell me where they want to go. So if I start them off in the starting town, I tell them that to their north, there's swamp. It's hard to see, but there is swamp in here as well. So I'd say that in the north and northwest, there's swamp. There's a river that runs northeast, bends and goes south, and all around you elsewhere is clear terrain. Uh, where would you like to go? And let's say for the sake of argument that these players were seeking out this wizard's tower up here. They've been tasked with finding it, or there's something there that they want, whatever. That's just going to give us a place to go. Obviously, in a hex crawl campaign, there might not be a goal. They might just want to go explore and, and bother people. And I'm all for that. I love that. Hex crawls, to me, are really the embodiment of that sort of open world game that, that I really love about old school TSR d and So, my players might say, uh, we're going to follow the river upstream uh, until it bends, because they've been given directions or whatnot. And a rumor table is, is wonderful for hex maps. You should ab absolutely have a rumor table as to, oh, this is in this hex, this is in that hex, um, there's a feature here, there's a feature there. And we'll talk about generating features and finding hidden features and whatnot in a bit. But let's say they say, okay, we're going we're gonna to go along the, the river. Uh, until it bends. And so they've they've got three movement points, let's just say, and these are all clear, so one... Oh, and of course the whole reason that I have this uh, sheet here is so that we can use a wet erase marker to track the party's progress. Um, this is a technically a dry erase. I would definitely recommend wet erase, though. Uh, it's a lot easier to move. So uh, one, two, three, and they're, they end in this hex. Now, of course, I would roll for uh, encounters and lost chance. I wouldn't roll for lost chance if they were going off of uh, a river or a landmark like that. So I'll say that there's no chance of getting lost as long as they're following a river. However, there might be a chance for an encounter. Um, and not only would I roll a d6 for the encounter, you know, an encounter on a one, but I would also roll for encounter time, which tells me if they have the encounter in the morning, in the middle of the day, the evening, or at night. And the die that I would roll to determine would uh, be based on how clear or savage, I guess, that hex is. Um, is it teeming with monsters? If so, I would roll a d10, which would give them a pretty good chance to have an encounter in the middle of the night, which would result in magic users not being able to have their spells prepared for the next day. So night encounters are pretty annoying. Um... But where, whereas with a, a clear 
hex, I would definitely use something more like a, uh, a, a D6. Um, when they're not going off of uh, a, a landmark like a river or something like that, which let's say it's the next day, so everybody takes a ration off of their sheets, and I would then check off another day on the calendar, uh, to start off the next day. I would also roll for Lost Chance. Now, Lost Chance is usually given as a d6, but I like to use a d12, because then I can also generate how they get lost. So with the d6, it just tells me that they're lost, and then I need to make another roll to see how they veer. But with the d12, I can be true to the d6 chances, whereas I can also say, all right, they're going to go clockwise 60 degrees, which is one hex face. So let's say they tell me they're going to head northwest. Okay, so I, they, they camp at the bend in the river, and I tell them, all right, to your north, you see a swamp. Across the river to the northeast, there's more swamp, um, and surrounding you is clear terrain. However, to the northwest, the trees start to get a little denser, and they say, all right, well, we're going to head northwest then. All right, so at the beginning of the day, I would roll for their encounter chance, and I would roll for their loss chance. And counter chance, uh, the, the base chance is usually whatever hex they start in. So even though they're going to move from clear terrain probably into difficult terrain, I'd still roll for the clear terrain chance. Um, and if I rolled, let's say, uh, a 2, instead of going into this hex right here, they would go counterclockwise 60 degrees, which would actually put them back here uh, at their river tile, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I mean, you could play it like that if you wanted, but I would probably eschew uh, Lost Chance for, for one more day while, they're, while they've still got the, uh, the river. Um, so they've moved into this hex tile. They have two movement points left. So I would then describe to them, I would say, all right, um, from your, to your north and northwest, there's dense forest. To your northeast, there's a swamp. Uh, to your southeast through southwest, there's clear terrain. Where would you like to go? And they'll say, all right, well, we're going to head uh, northwest, right? <clears throat> and you roll for lost and encounters once a day, not once a hex. So I wouldn't roll for chance to get lost or for encounters because I've already done that at the beginning of the day. And this makes a faster movement speed advantageous because there's less chances of encounters, there's less chances of getting lost. So they move into this hex, which has a feature. And so I would check... Uh, my feature key, and I would see that there's a hollow tree here. So I would describe to them, all right, you set up to camp for the night. Um, there's a huge hollow tree uh, here in the forest. And you can get as descriptive as you like. I'm just, for the sake of time, trying to keep things at a, at a pretty good clip. And I'd tell them, all right, surrounding you on all sides, except for where you've come from, there is dense forest. To the south, the forest becomes a little bit less dense. The next day, now we can really start to roll for getting lost and for encounters. And because they're in difficult terrain, the encounters are going to happen on a 2 and 6. Um, and the lost chances, of course, uh, you see with the clear terrain, they can either they can veer in either direction 60 degrees or 1 hex face. With rough terrain, not only can they do that, but also there's a chance that they veer 2 hex faces in either direction. And with very rough terrain, they might actually go back the way they came or lose a day. And then 7 to 12, then they don't get lost. This is rough terrain, not very rough, so there's no chance of the 180 or losing a day. But I would roll and check that out. They get no encounter. However, they would veer clockwise 60 degrees. So they tell me they're going to head north. Well, I secretly put them northwest. Now they've got one movement point left for today, but these rough terrain tiles cost two movement points to move into. So what do you do about that? Well, I like to have one movement point per day roll over to the next day. Um, because if they have three movement points a day and they're moving through two movement point cost tiles, they just they, they lose a lot of time to that, that extra move point at the end of the day that sort of disappears. So basically, they can move uh, one tile one day and two tiles the next day, one and two and one and two, etc., etc. That's just how I like to play it. It's not that much more to keep track of in my head, and I have everything here to sort of streamline most things. It's really not a big deal. One other thing that I should mention is, of course... You have the north and south faces, but there's really no east or west. There's just northwest, southwest, northeast, southeast. This used to bug me, uh, you know, if players say, well, we want to head east. What does that mean? Where do you put them? But 
after struggling with it for a while, just using the snake method of, you know, southeast, northeast, southeast, northeast, if they're heading east. It's not perfect, but it definitely works, and it's, it's not a huge deal at all. Okay. So they camp here for the night, or, or whatever. They think they're heading north, and they accidentally head northwest. Now, as far as giving your players a map, um, you can do that. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend giving them a hex map and having them fill it out because they are going to get lost. The chances are just high enough of that. And they're going to have to make and remake the map so many times. Um, I would just give them a sheet of blank paper and have them track relatively where they are to their best guess. That would be my suggestion. That's that's what I would do rather than sort of have them deal with the frustration of, of doing all that. Okay, I also want to talk about generating hex features on the fly. So, hexes have features, and the question is, how many features per hex? And a lot of people make the very compelling argument that hexes, six-mile hexes are huge, uh, we should have multiple features per hex, but that is way too much to keep track of. I mean, if you have a large hex map of hundreds and hundreds of hexes, Keeping track of multiple features per hex is just not feasible. And furthermore, uh, uh, keying all those hexes, you'd be flipping back and forth pages and pages and pages trying whenever they moved into a new hex. Um, I like manageable. If I can keep it on a two-page spread, I've got my, my hex map here and my key here. You see I've got plenty of room. I could probably fit, what, like 40 features in there? Uh, so uh, I do a, a 1 in 20 chance that there's a hex feature generated. This sounds really low, and it is really low, but this is for a long-standing campaign, and players are going to come into hexes multiple times, so there's many chances to generate a hex. And I don't generate hexes per day, I generate them as they're entered. So if they enter this blank hex, um, I would roll the d20, and if it came up as a 1, then I would consult my little features thing here, or if you have the Judges Guild, you can consult the Judges Guild. Uh, I just have really simple, I know it's kind of hard to read, but we've got uh, roll a d8, we've got uh, 1 to 5 is natural, 6 to 7 is man-made, and 8 is wondrous, and then I have natural, man-made, and wondrous uh, uh, subtables here. This can generate things as simple as a boulder. Uh, a, a spring, or if they're already in a river tile, it could generate a waterfall. A pond, or if they're in a swamp tile, it generates quicksand instead. Uh, Man-made, we've got ruins, cottages, fortresses, wizards' towers, shrines, uh, which have a four and six chance of being inhabited. Uh, that would be the cottages, fortresses, wizards' towers, and shrines. Ruins are, I, I don't ever inhabit them with anything other than monsters, which is why they're ruins. Um, although you could. And again, th these these tables right here are where the flavor of your world really shines through. So I would recommend making your own, because it's going to reflect the milieu that you want to provide to your players. And then Wanderous, we have things like fairy rings, obelisks, dolmens, gem rocks, swords and stones, ley lines. This is where you can get really fun with it, and things that I really like. And if I were to generate a hex, let's say that I did generate a hex. Let's go ahead and... Um, <clears throat> not toss the die off the table. Uh, so we've got eight, which is wondrous, which is nice. And I'll roll a d10 to see which wondrous feature is generated, and we've got a two, which is an obelisk. So they're in this hex, and they've generated a feature. We're up to nine here as far as features go. I placed some ahead of time. So we'll go ahead and just take this out real quick. And whatever hex they were in, if I can remember. Which is right here. Uh, we'll write a 10. And then in our key, we write 10. And we generated what, an obelisk? Yeah. So we've already got an obelisk in number six, but I don't think it's a big deal. There's, it's D&D. There's many, many different types of obelisks. Um, so here's a different obelisk. And that would be if the players ended up uh, having generated a feature there in that hex. This is normally not so difficult to put this back in the plastic sheet 
but I don't have a lot of desk space, so you're going to have to bear with me. Give me one second. Okay, like I said, I promise it's not usually that difficult, and again, it only happens 1 in 20 chances, so um, when you have more desk space than I do, it's a lot easier to slide that piece of paper in and out. Um, so they're back here, they're, they've, they've found an obelisk, and that can give them a, a, a chance to orient themselves. Now, keep in mind, the players think that the obelisk is just north of the hollow tree. However, it's not. It's to the northwest. So if they were to go south, expecting to see this hollow tree, they would then be greeted um, with no hollow tree, which might give them a clue that they got off course somewhere. So hex features are pretty important for allowing your players to remain oriented. However, really don't be afraid of letting your players get lost, because that's part of the fun of the hex crawl, is getting completely lost and finding new and wondrous things. Um, in the Judges Guild Wolverlands of High Fantasy, one of my favorite things is that they have this really, really in-depth system for creating caves and cave systems. And the caves themselves have a chance of generating dungeon entrances. So it's just this wonderful style of campaign where you come across a cave completely at random, you map it out, you explore it, and there's an entrance to a dungeon in it, and then you generate the dungeon. So it's this whole campaign that comes across uh, that comes off of this this uh, random thing that you find in the wilderness, and that to me is the essence of old school D and D, and what I really really love about hex crawls. Um, so I like to talk about encounters uh, as we go through this let's say the players say okay we're gonna we, we're surrounded on all sides by uh, by by dense forest we want to move north and uh, I would of course let them go north and this is where they would end their day I'm not really keeping too careful track of their movement points right now in my head because I'm trying to talk about many many different things and and trying to not waste your time um, so it would be a lot easier to keep track of that if I wasn't trying to do 15 different things at once. Um, so let's say that they, well, this would be the end of the day, so they wouldn't have an encounter, but the next day I would describe, okay, you've got, you're in dense forest, you're surrounded by dense forest. And don't be afraid of these sort of boring descriptions. I don't really want to say it like that. How about, let's say, these short descriptions. You're surrounded on all sides by dense forest. That's going to happen, and that's going to happen more often than not. Not every single turn needs to be teeming with detail. Um, it's kind of like describing every little move in combat. That might be fun for the first couple of sessions, but after long enough, it just bogs down the game and slows things down. I like to keep things short and brisk with hex crawls because you're going to enter a lot of hexes in a hex crawl, and I'm not going to take five minutes to describe each and every hex because we waste too much time. So you're surrounded on all sides by dense forest. Which way would you like to go? And then the players tell me. But let's say that they say, we want to go north, and I roll a an, an encounter for them. Okay? I flip back. I've got my Moldve expert uh, um, monsters here. We've got the encounter table and then the subtable. So I generate a monster off of that. Now, here's where percent in layer comes in, which is something that can be confusing for people. Before I talk about layers, though, I do want to make a, a side note and say that you should have mass combat rules available for you. Um, in wilderness travel, familiarize yourself with rules regarding mercenaries because your players are going to want to hire some muscle to come with them. And we'll talk about mercenaries and morale in a second. But just a way that you're comfortable running combat between 30, 40, 50 combatants, because that's where old school D&D really shines, is in those, is in those large-scale battles. Delta's OED Book of War is a great resource for that, but for a quick and dirty one on the fly, just chuck handfuls of D6s equal to the HD of the creatures fighting, and 5s and 6s are hits, so a player rolling a 5 or 6 on a D6 versus a monster would destroy 1 HD of that monster. If it's a 1 HD monster, it's destroyed. If it's a 2 HD monster, now that only needs one more hit to be destroyed. And then monsters versus players, I just use 4 HP as damage. So if a monster rolls a 5 against a player, it does 4 damage, because that's kind of the average roll of a D6. Just a way to, to run combat between many, many people. If you want to use the base combat system, go ahead, but I like doing it this way, because then I can run skirmish-scale stuff. My players can travel around with bands of mercenaries and get in fight with goblin warbands. It's just great fun. And we'll talk about morale in a second. I know, there's a lot of detail to cover. I'm sorry about this. But we got our monster manual. We've got our percent in lair. 
And what that means is, if I encounter this monster in the wilderness, what's the chance that I've accidentally stumbled across its lair? And this is also where Judge's Guild Will of the Lens of High Fantasy really shines, because the caves are essentially a lair generator. And I would recommend that, along with these materials, you do have some way to generate lairs on the fly, even if it's something as simple as geomorphs. Um, or you want to use something like Appendix A in the DMG. Something that you can generate on the fly, or generate a few monster lairs ahead of time. But... I like to generate them on the fly. And basically, whatever the percent in layer is, let's say it's a 45% chance in layer, you roll your D percentile dice, and, uh, oh, look at that, it was below 45. So this is a monster, monster encounter in the layer. So let's say they've encountered a dragon. Because it's dungeons and dragons. we got to have a dragon in here. So they're in this hex, and they've encountered a dragon's lair. So you'd go through your whole uh, expert uh, uh, combat order, where you determine the distance, which is in yards on the overland. Uh, you'd roll for surprise, you'd roll for initiative, and you'd roll for monster reactions, and then you could start the combat if combat begins, which of course not every encounter results in combat. Uh, but anyhow, since they've encountered a lair, I am going to add it to the map. So this would be number 11, and 11 would be lair of the green dragon. Perfect. Let me slot this back in. I'm going to pause beforehand. Okay, sorry, I bumped it a little bit. Lair of the green dragon. Uh, this is an 11. You can't really see because the pen's not really very inky, but they're in here. Lair of the green dragon. And then I can add to my little dungeon key. I, I put an 11 here, and then I use whatever sort of uh, procedure that I want to generate a cave system, and we'll just do a really quick one, obviously. You got the main cave here, and there's a little branch off here, and here's a little treasure room. Whatever it ends up being, okay? And here's my lair of ba 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 ba. Okay? And I roll for treasure, etc, etc. And, of course, layers can be much more complicated and, and deep than these, but there you go. There's layers. Um, and, of course, layers have more treasure in them, but they're more dangerous, etc., etc. And the last thing I want to talk about, I think, is morale, which this is a good way of getting players to think about how they're traveling. What I mean is perhaps they decide... All right, we've heard a rumor, because you should be using your rumor table, that uh, we want to uh, not have a campfire in a certain area of the woods because we don't want to attract monsters. Okay, so you take that into account, and you maybe don't roll for encounter, or you don't roll for nighttime encounter, or whatever. Uh, however, not being able to cook your food or whatever would result in a morale encounter for any followers of the players. And you would test morale whenever something like this happened. Maybe on your random encounters, uh, you make your own encounter tables, and one of the encounters is general misfortune. Like a horse loses a shoe, or a wagon loses a wheel, or you, you, know, you drop your food in the river, or anything like that. Maybe certain of these would, would result in morale checks. Now, players can keep their followers happy by providing them with ale and, and you know, wine in their water skins instead of water, which I guess would make them wine skins. But generally, they're trying to keep their followers happy. They might have to negotiate the pay or something like that. You get the picture. And then if the followers fail the morale check, then they might desert. Or if they fail the morale check uh, uh, egregiously enough, they might even mutiny or, or take things and run off into the woods. And there's all kinds of fun things you can do with that, with players tracking down their deserters and, and bringing them to justice or something like that. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and this is just the sort of thing that makes hex crawls beautiful. I, I really would recommend going into hex crawls with a, a very general goal, rather than uh, some very specific, you know, this travel itinerary of, we've got to get here by this day and do this by this day, because it is just so much fun to get absolutely uh, bewilderingly lost in a hex. And before I go, I'd like to talk about finding hidden features and as well as as, as hunting for food because that's um, that's related and how I handle these things. So we've talked about movement points 
And as far as searching for a hidden feature, and you can use your hidden features however you like, um, maybe your wondrous features are usually hidden, or maybe players have heard a rumor about a hidden feature, or maybe they're on a quest to find this rare mushroom or something like that, and it's a, you can find it in these certain hexes, but you have to actually find it. The way I do that is a d6 chance for clear hexes, d8 chance for rough, and a d10 chance for very rough, and then their chance of unearthing that feature or whatever they're looking for, or if they're hunting, like I said, their chances of getting food is however many movement points they spend. So let's say at the beginning of the day, well, why say at the beginning of the day? Let's say the ne they had their encounter with the green dragon, whatever, whatever, and they move on. They go north another hex. But in the encounter of the green dragon, the green dragon snatched up their halfling and flew away, and their halfling was the one they made carry all the food. So now they're without food. So now we've got to hunt. And so, of course, I would use the same uh, uh, system I would to hunt as I would to reveal hexes. And they say, all right, uh, we got away from the dragon. We're here now. We've got a few hours of daylight left. Let's say, for the sake of argument, they have two movement points left. Um, since these are rough terrain, they have a 2 and 8 chance of getting food if they spend that time hunting. And if you think that's a little harsh, maybe double whatever movement points they spend so they'd have a 4 and 8 chance of getting food. Or instead of using this based on clear, rough, or very rough, uh, however much wildlife you think is appropriate. If they were in a barren wasteland, maybe I'd use a d10, but because they're in a, a, a dense forest, maybe I'd use a d6. Of course, it's up to your, uh, it's up to your discretion. So they spend the rest of the day hunting for food. If I was nice, I would double the movement points they spend, so it's a 4 and 6 for spending 2 movement points. Whatever. Um, and then if they are searching for something or they say, alright, we want to spend the day exploring this hex, seeing whatever's in there. Okay, I might roll to see if there's a hex feature generated. If there is, I just I act as if I generated a hex feature randomly and I would use this feature generator and put it in here. And maybe the hidden features have some treasure in them or something a little more interesting than your run-of-the-mill feature. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and think if there's anything that I didn't cover. All right, you know what, for the life of me, I think that's everything. So a quick recap. Three ring binder, clear plastic sheets, calendar, hex paper, graph paper, Right? At the beginning of the day, you're rolling for encounters, you're rolling for lost chance. If they have an encounter, maybe you want to roll to see what the encounter time is. Spend movement points to move through hexes. Generate your weather ahead of time, maybe. Keep track of, uh, of events and whatnot. Oh. And this is a good thing to mention. Let's say they slayed the green dragon. All right. Well, I've got my uh, I've got my event here that says there's a green dragon sighting near the town. Well, I would just cross that off because there's no dragon anymore. So that's how players can sort of affect these things. If there's a peasant revolt, uh, their mercenaries cost more because mercenaries uh, cost more during times of war things like that. And they might say, well, hell, let's go quash this peasant revolt ourselves because we don't want to pay our mercenaries that much. That's legitimate. That's fine. Uh, every day you just sort of check off uh, your, your, your days to keep track of the days. And uh, much like, much like uh, a dungeon, if you've got a hundred foot hallway, you don't have to describe every 30 feet of it. If they just say, we're going to follow the river till it bends, they follow the river till it bends. Other times they might go hex by hex. The days... I'm doing air quotes, you can't really see. The day's subdivision is really just about rolling for encounters and rolling for getting lost. Other than that, and, you know, the inexorable advancement of time that brings us toward these weather events or these world events, it really doesn't matter much. You don't have to go hex by hex by hex. Uh, you can say you travel until the river bends. But uh, most of the time, especially when they're lost or in these areas where there's not a lot of features, you might end up going hex by hex by hex. Uh, really, all you do each day is roll for encounter, roll for lost. And, of course, a faster movement speed, like I said. I forgot to turn my alarm off, sorry. Faster movement speed, like I said, means that they're rolling for these encounters and these, these sort of negative things like getting lost and getting encounters. They're rolling for it less. I think that's it. Please let me know if you have any questions. And uh, I will try to contextualize some stuff and put it in the description and put some links and whatnot. If there's any questions you have left... Let me know. I'm just repeating myself now. So happy hex crawling. Have fun.